Last class, last class, we talked about how the deuteronomistic history kind of presented and a picture of what the Israelite dream looks like, right? We compared it to the American dream and started trying to think through what the Israelite dream might look at or might look like. We uh, we saw how when we tried to envision the Israelite dream, a lot of times we would read back onto it the American dream. Right, and be like, oh, surely they just want the same things we do. Um, some of you, though, incorporated the Abrahamic covenant, right? This promise for land and descendants um, and kingship. So some of you kind of drew from that, which is really good, too. But today we're going to be looking at Joshua and see kind of how Joshua presents the Israelite dream um, and the themes and the kind of ideology that that book kind of encapsulates. So that's what we're going to look at today. And what's really great is that the book of Joshua makes this really easy for us to see because in pretty much the first nine verses of the book of Joshua, it gives us a really good insight into just what the Deuteronomistic history is all about. So if you have your text with you, um, I encourage you to open that up. Um, I also have it up here on the board. So we're going to pretty much walk through, this is chapter one. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And it gives us a really good insight into the perspective that the Deuteronomistic history is coming from. Okay, so we're going to just walk through this. So the first ones we're going to look at is verses 1 through 2. Okay, and it says this. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... Right, so from right, right at the outset, right, Moses is a good guy, right? We're, we're definitely not going to, um, you know, put Moses in any negative light, right? After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the, uh, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Okay. Any uh, any comments on this? Any anything that you guys kind of notice about what's going on here in verses one and two? Anything stand out? He's following the footsteps of Moses. Good. Very much so. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's not really. It's not. We'll get to more explicit places where it says it. Is it gonna let me highlight? Okay. Yeah, we've got this idea that Joshua is being connected to Moses, yes. right? In a very explicit way, and it'll get more explicit as the text continues, right? For example, we'll go ahead and look here at number at verse 5. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, right? You see that? So the text from the outside is connecting Joshua to Moses. Moses is a huge character, is central to the story of the Israelites, and the book is going to connect Joshua to Moses in that way. Right, in a sense, being a new Moses. Now, it's interesting, having read uh, Deuteronomy, is that Moses never enters the Promised Land. Okay, Moses never actually enters into the Promised Land. Moses leads the people right up to the point where they, like, across the Jordan, where they can see the Promised Land. He gives his big farewell address, and then he dies. Okay. Why does Moses never enter the promised land? Joe, do you know? Is it because of when, uh, I think they wanted water and he hit that oh, rock he, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Is that why? Yeah. There's this very interesting story that the text gives where the, the, the rationale it gives, that the text itself gives, for why Moses cannot enter the promised land is apparently there's this one time where God tells Moses, speak to the rock and water will flow out of it. And Moses instead takes his staff and hits the rock, and water flows out of it. It seems like a very incredibly trivial reason to not let somebody who just liberated an entire people not to enter into the promised land. But this is all about um, if you don't do something, then there will be consequences. Sure. And that's, and that's how it's going to be portraying that, right? Mm -hmm. that, that this kind of requires obedience. Yes. Right? At all times. At all times, right? I'm looking at you. So... <laughs> So it seems like a very trivial thing. There may be other reasons why the text doesn't let Moses into the land. 
Um, one reason is that Moses is a distinctly Egyptian name. The text tries to claim it as a Hebrew name and tries to give it this wordplay um, that's kind of iffy. It'd be like somebody saying, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, you know, I named him Philip because he fills me up of, with joy. Right? Where it's like, that's not where that word comes from at all. Right? That's what the Hebrew text kind of does in Exodus with Moses' name. It tries to give it this nice little Hebrew meaning, but it's a distinctly Egyptian name. Did, Egyptian, if, did the Egyptian raise him? Mm -hmm. he yep, he was raised by Pharaoh's family, or in Pharaoh's household. So, in a sense, right, remember the Israelite people are a people to be set apart. Right? To not do as they do in the land of Egypt and to not do as they do in the land of Canaan. So possibly there's this idea that Moses having this kind of Egyptian identity needs to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Right? From the promised land. Another way of looking at it is that while we have with Moses a figure who is um, how do I want to say it? Is central to Israel's liberation the text is now moving from liberation to conquest. And so in a sense, we have a new leader for a new task. Mm -hmm. right? Moving from liberation from Egypt to taking of Canaan, and this is where Joshua is going to step in, a new leader for a new task. Could that whole idea of Moses, because he has like an Egyptian identity, like could that idea be like, I guess, you can look at him, all the Israelites as they can kind of Mo like that identity on Moses, they can cast it on everybody, and like an idea of like they're purging the Egyptian out of themselves and they're starting to be somewhere else. Is that in a sense, yeah? Okay. So, I mean, is that I think I think I followed what you're saying. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, weird way of describing it. But I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying, trying to think. think. No, but yeah, in a sense of getting rid of all that they have, all that they were in Egypt, right? So all of the idolatry, right? And and the bonds of slavery. So any anything that brings of an identity that would link them to Egypt is kind of getting left on the other side of the Jordan. Mm -hmm. They also also that kind of still goes in with the, the thing that everyone over a certain age did not go. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. They, they killed them. They were all killed out in the desert. So right. Like, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. That wasn't there in the Bible like there was like a, a specific age that you had to be or something. I think there was. I what think in Exodus, point? yeah, it says something along the lines of, you know, no one of, of that certain generation right. who has committed this this crime. So that's what I'm saying, like that whole idea of like purging the Egyptian out of their right. system or whatever. Right. <laughs> which which connects really well to our idea of cleanliness and holiness. Mm -hmm. Right of being that's set apart. That's cool. Right. So so this is probably maybe some kind of deeper rationale for why Moses doesn't enter into the promised land, more than just the explicit statement of, well, he struck a rock instead of spoke to a rock, right? Now, let's continue with verses 3 and through like the first half of 5. He says this, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I promised to Moses. Again, that connection. From the wilderness and, uh, see, let's see, from the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great see in, uh, in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Good. Stop there. Mm -hmm. Anything stand out in that, in that passage? You made a promise to him? Good. So we've got a promise here. Mm -hmm. Good. Right. So we could say, you know, every place that the soul of your foot will tread upon I have given you as I promised. Right. So it's linking back to that promise to Moses. Mm -hmm. Right. You mean that, 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 that and, and also elaborate on that, that covenant of Moses is still, has been like kind of piggybacked on um, yeah. him too as well. For sure, for sure. Joshua was stepping into that same, in, this, in the same way that Joshua was kind of stepping into that leadership identity of Moses, mm -hmm. he's also stepping into that covenant relationship yes. that, Moses, that Moses laid out. Good. What else? Three, three through this oh. first part of five. He also had told him that um, that he will um, that he he shall you know. He was the same God before he gave him. 
Okay, so again, like kind of connecting, like in the same way that Exodus connected to Genesis, right? Joshua, he was connected. Verse 5, no one should stand against him. Like, that means he gave him, he gave him that, you know, no adversary that comes up against, you know, the uh, Israel, like, army will, can't, will stand. Good, we'll get to that in just a second. No, 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 that's perfect. We'll get, we'll get there. Um, does anything at the uh, anything in this connect to maybe some of the themes that we looked at la- looked at last class? Something terrible. How do you join? Are we going to play from unclean to clean? Like how do you take me from the wilderness? Okay. In the sense, maybe what were you saying about the territory? What do you mean territory? Um, from the wilderness of the Lebanon, as far as the great river from the river of the Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and the great sea in the west shall be your territory. Okay. So, um, it can pretty well much go along with the promise that the guy says and the immense that sells it. So mm-hmm. I'm thinking, now this is just pursuing now, the territory <laughs> would be a part of that. He, yeah. he's prom- it's a promise. It's, it's not part a promise. Of promise. So it will come to pass. Okay. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're going to be, think about, you know, in, um, I think we brought this up in one of our classes about how how we saw in Genesis, you know, you have place and then things were put in their place yeah. in order to fulfill their purpose. Here, in a sense, we have Israel being able to fulfill its purpose by being in its place, <laughs> right? Think about this, though, too, this idea about from the wilderness, who's, who's giving this land? God. Yeah, God is giving this land. Mm-hmm. Here we have again this idea of God as the sole land granter. Yeah. Oh, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Making that connection now? Yeah. 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 Yahweh is the sole land granter, right? All of earth is Yahweh's. It is Yahweh who decides who is where. Right? And this is Yahweh's land to give. Right? And it is Yahweh who is giving it. Right? Every place that the sole of your foot will try to find, I have given to you. Right, so this idea that, that, that Canaan is Yahweh's first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Right, now this, this idea of no one shall be able to stand against you. The book of Joshua pretty much tells the story of a unified Israel that is just wholesale just taking over the land of Canaan. Pretty much that there is, there is no army that can stand against them. There's a couple times where, you know, um, the people of Israel mess up, they repent, and then they go back and win the fight. Is that right? the answer? Unified, yes. <laughs> because they're, because the book of, let's see, what were some of the other, unsuccessful, unsuccessful is the opposite of what they are in Joshua. Uh-huh. They are incredibly Same. successful. Right, this is how the book is presenting them. Um, if I, I'm going to swap over here to, uh, this is chapter 11, uh, verses 16 through 23-ish. So this is the summary of Joshua's conquest. It says, so Joshua took all the land, right, all the land, the hill country and all the Negev, and it goes through and it lists all these places. Um, then when we get down to verse 20, for it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts, the people in the land, so that they would come against Israel in battle in order that they might be utterly destroyed right notice how many times we're getting words like all and utterly Mm -hmm. right gave them all the land so they would be utterly destroyed Mm -hmm. um and might receive no mercy but be exterminated right utterly exterminated um Mm -hmm. and then goes through a couple more things and then in 23 so joshua took the whole, the whole land, land mm-hmm. right? Um, according to all the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal allotments, and the land rest had rest from war. What does that signify that was used in those words? Just, just how total the conquest is, right? There, there is nothing that he is not that Joshua has not taken. They took all the land. The people were utterly exterminated. He had possession of the whole land, right? The whole all. So just like this is this is all encompassing. Okay. Right? Can you subject? Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Was this just sitting there? Mm-hmm. That's my super 
recording. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Just getting it nice, nice and close here. <laughs> right. The way that Joshua, the way that Joshua presents this, is that there is the book. The way the book of Joshua presents it is that Joshua and Israel have have success at every turn. Right. It goes through, I think, in the first 11, 16 chapters or so, just total conquest, just one place after another, it's falling. Right. Um, and we get this idea in Joshua that's called the ban. And your book doesn't talk a lot about it. So I want to bring it up. And the ban is discussed in, I believe it's chapter 6 of Joshua. I'm going to turn to chapter 6. It's verses 18 through 21. Okay. This is, uh, I do believe this is God speaking in this passage. It says, as for you, keep away from the things devoted to destruction. Right? Keep away, be set apart from these things. Right? Here again, that idea of cleanliness and holiness. Um, keep away from the things devoted to destruction so as to not covet and take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel an object for destruction, bringing trouble upon it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze, so on, all these things, they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, trumpets were blown, and so on and so forth. They devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. Right? Nobody is spared. Right? <laughs> young and old, women and men. Right? Children are, are not spared. Um, the elderly are not spared. Women are not spared. Right? They aren't just going in and killing and fighting the men and saying, okay, the rest of the inhabitants can stay. Right? Not only that, so not only are all the people destined for destruction, but all the, all the things, right, the gold and everything that would be of worth should then be taken to the treasury in the house of the Lord. Right? So all of, all of the stuff is for the temple. Right? So in a sense, you have this idea that Israel cannot contaminate itself with anything that is in the land of Canaan. Right? The people, all the people are destined for destruction, and all the things are given to God. Right? And this is what gets referred to as the ban. The ban is the destruction? It's the idea that everything is to be destroyed or given to God. Pretty much kill everyone, and the spoils belong to Yahweh. Mm -hmm. yeah. The text uses the phrase uh, devoted. Other texts use the word reserved. That these things are either devoted or reserved for destruction or devoted to Yahweh. That's what it says. That's the right now. What's I was just thinking that's where Saul messed up. He was trying to go back and approve it as they kind of did it on the slide. The Amorites, the Amalekites. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to yeah. Saul. That's a little bit down the road, yeah. yeah. Good. So this is the idea of the ban, right? In order to ensure this kind of utter, ex utter extermination and possession of the whole land, right, is you have to have this ban. Right? And in a sense, this also, like we keep coming back to, works with the idea of cleanliness and holiness. Right? Uh, this idea of being set apart. Right? So that Israel isn't contaminated with anything that is already in the land. Okay. Now what's interesting too here, this idea of your territory, is one of my biggest regrets about speaking English is that we don't have any plural second person pronoun other than y'all, right? <laughs> and I've yet to see a Bible with the word y'all in it. Um, this is plural. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's the okay, KJV, you don't mess with that. Um, this is, this is, this you here is plural, your territory. Um, even the idea of this, this should actually be the soul of this you is plural, right? And this you is plural. This is not just talking to Joshua. This is talking to all the people. To the nation. To the people of Israel. So basically saying wherever Joshua steps, then Well but no, because well this is this is what's fun. And, and like Hebrew text does this a lot. It plays around a lot 
was switching between the pronouns, talking to you person singular and you person plural nation, okay. right? Why didn't they? Why didn't they say you all? Just English translators don't want to do that. Which sucks. Yes, it makes confusion <laughs> because we lose we lose that yeah. that in the text, oh, yeah. right? And so what's going on here, and what we see beginning in Deuteronomy and continuing through the whole Deuteronomistic history, is this shift. It's very interesting from the text stating or using the phrase children of Israel to using the phrase all Israel. So you're saying there's one in the no. Oh. The, the text shifts, so in, in Genesis, X, well, yeah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, we see the phrase children of Israel predominantly. Once we hit Deuteronomy, though, and through Joshua, Judges, Kings, and Samuel, we see the phrase all Israel. So there's this shift of the idea of Israel being kinship, to being this national identity, right? They're no longer just saying, hey, you descendants of this guy named Israel. They're saying, hey, you people who self-identify as the people of Israel, right? The Israelites, you could say, right? Because time and time again, what we see in the book of Joshua is the phrase, uh, especially when they are fighting, all of Israel went out against the Hittites or the Canaanites or the Ammonites or you know whatever group of people you're talking about. Time and time again, you get the phrase "all Israel did this," right? And that's very important for the Book of Joshua because they're presenting this idea that all of Israel has come from Egypt, walked through the walked through the wilderness and is now entering the land of Canaan as one whole group, right? Does that make sense? So there's this idea that's now forming of Israel as this national identity. Now, let's move on to five here. Start with, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be courageous, for you shall put this people uh, in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give, to give them, right? Again, this connection to Moses, right? Now, what's really fun in Hebrew is that every time Hebrew repeats itself, um, the the kind of the purpose is to intensify it, right? English, yeah, it does it a lot, but we, we even miss it sometimes in Hebrew. Why does it keep doing this? Um, I'm gonna tell you this little guy. Huh? You might have nudged it. Might have nudged it. If you ever see, I don't think there's any examples here, but if you ever see the word very in Hebrew, for example, if somebody is very hungry, the Hebrew actually translates literally hungry, hungry. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, in, so th there is no word for very in Hebrew. Right? It just literally says, Saul was hungry, hungry, and so he sought food, right? So we don't have edges? Uh, that would, yeah. Well, I mean, hungry, they don't have intensifiers oh, okay. like that, right? So they just say a word twice. And English does this too, right? I mean, like with the hungry, hungry hippos, you're like, okay, no, they're seriously hungry. <laughs> right? Or it's like, did you guys kiss or did you like kiss, kiss? <laughs> yeah. Right? So even English still does this, right? And we did it. Oh, what's that? Like, like, you yeah, like, you like, 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 like. <laughs> Right? So English does the same thing. So whenever you are reading in the Hebrew Bible and you see repetition, that's what it's doing. Every time it's repeating itself, it's trying to intensify the idea. Okay? And it does it in this kind of very simple way, but it also does this way in, in the same light. You are taking after Moses. Hey, you are taking after Moses. And it goes on after here in verses um, 10 and so on. It keeps connecting to Moses. Yeah, I mean, I think even, uh, let me see here. Oh, of course, whenever I try to find something off the top of my head, it never works. But 
Here's this constant uh, 13. Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, right? So it keeps going with this connection to Moses, right? So let's see. Um, Moses. So right, and it's actually because of this strong connection to Moses. What's that? I was just saying, I think the game. Okay, yeah, it constantly pops up. It's for this reason that sometimes the book of Joshua gets lumped in with the Torah, right? What was the, do you, anybody remember the, the word that starts with a P for the first five books? Right, the Pentateuch. Right, the Pentateuch, because pent, penta means five, right? Sometimes because of just how much Joshua points back to Moses, that sometimes Joshua gets thrown into that whole series of books, and he gets referred to as the Hexateuch. Hmm. Hexa meaning six, right? Hexagon, six sides, the Hexateuch. So sometimes people will, will refer to the Hexateuch because of just how frequently the book of Joshua is going to connect back to Moses and Exodus. What's that? Seven. seven. The seven prefects, or? Yeah, it's seven or something. I don't know. I'll, I'll find it. Okay. Good. Okay, so let's read, let's see, just seven and eight. And, and nine's kind of a nice little summary. The seven and eight is the last part I want to look at today. We're five time. Okay, it says this, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. There again, there's that connection. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may succeed, or so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. Uh, for then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall be successful. What is, what is central to those two verses? If you do this, you'll keep it there. Mm -hmm. Expand on that a little more. Or, or somebody expand on that for her. Because that's... Huh? Obedient. obedient to what? It doesn't say covenant. Not covenant, but the... Uh, Oh, the law. The law. What's 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 the word in Hebrew for law? Torah. Torah. Remember, in Torah is so much more than just law. This is another another place where, unfortunately, the English kind of traps us into a very narrow definition. Right? Obedience to the Torah. Everything that we got told in, in like the second half of Exodus through Deuteronomy is what's getting referred to here. Right? Obedience to the Torah. Right? And it's obedient if they are obedient to the Torah, then then what? That'll bless them. Right. Yeah. Then they'll be successful. Then they'll be blessed and be successful. Right? Here is is just like as clear as it gets for this this theme in the DH, right? In the Deuteronomistic history. This is as clear as it gets saying your success in the land depends on your obedience to the Torah. Right? Um so that you may be successful wherever you go. I mean, it says it like um, just outright there. Um, this book of law shall not depart, you shall meditate, act on the courts, but then you shall make your way prosperous and you shall be successful. Right? Think back to Leviticus, right? We saw that idea of um, if you do not follow the Torah, then the land will vomit you out. Right? This is Leviticus 18 and 20. Right? This idea of the land vomiting you out. If you do not follow the Torah, if you don't follow the law, then Moses has prescribed, prescribed. And so in a sense, the land itself becomes kind of this theological symbol for Israel. Right? It becomes this symbol of obedience. It's the place where faithfulness to God will be tested. Right? Whether or not Israel is able to be in the land or stay in the land will be a sign of Israel's faithfulness. <laughs> Right, so it becomes its own kind of theological symbol. Right, it's where the people of Israel live as the people of God. Right, it's it's very uh, intricately connected to their identity. Right, and remember we talked about Torah as what two things? Right, right worship and right community. Good, good, and it's so it's through this now. We have that broader, that broad picture of 
of the Torah, right? Obedience to, or like proper worship and proper community. What did we say that this gets whittled down to in the Germanistic history? Remember we talked about the, uh, like the American Constitution gets, we, from that we have this idea of freedom, and from the idea of freedom, then we focus on like this first, or the second commandment about bearing arms, mm -hmm. right? Is it faithfulness or obedience? No. Or, huh? Or? No. Mm -hmm. what, does it get, what does it get whittled down to? So, I mean, you mean the whole concept of what they're trying to create? The idea of Torah kind of gets narrowed down to, to one very set of part. No. Uh, can we get a letter? Huh? Oh my God. It's right. like it, it, it was yesterday. It was yeah. that the um, being in the temple? Good. Proper oh, worship. Oh. Is it no so which one? Proper worship? No. Uh, proper worship. Right. Proper, I don't know the you. obedience to the Torah gets centered down to proper worship, and proper worship even gets more narrowed down to worship at the temple. Okay. Right. So this idea of acting in accordance with the law for the Deuteronomistic history, this gets whittled down to proper proper worship in Jerusalem at the temple. To so what? And that's what. That's like the most significant thing. <laughs> this is this is the most important thing from this perspective. From the perspective of the Deuteronomistic history. Okay. Yes. You know, this is strange because in our history we are learning that the temples were taken over by other religions okay. because they felt like that was their place. Mm. And so they would take them and scrub the walls and take all the paintings down and mm. replace them with their own because of the temple itself. Right. So, yeah, and that's. Can I make connections? Cultural connections? Yeah. yeah. So when we read 7 through 8 here, right, and it talks about acting in accordance with the law, we do not here see an emphasis on proper community. We don't, in the Deuteronomistic history, we do not get an emphasis on justice. We're going to see that pop up with the prophets who are kind of reacting to this perspective in the Deuteronomistic history. But in the Deuteronomistic history, everything is leading us towards the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, because for them, what is most important about the law is this proper worship in Jerusalem. Yeah. So before in the Torah was the like, I guess the most prioritized thing was that community in worship, and then now it's worship in the temple. You don't really think of you know think of the Torah as being a constitution. Okay. In a sense, you don't really get any kind of emphasis with the constitution. It's like, look, just here it is. Right. right. So in the Torah, it's like, here are the laws for worship and community. You have to have both these things. From the perspective of the of the DH, it's saying everything hinges. Our so proper community and proper worship hinges on proper worship at the temple. So it's just the interpretation yeah. of their constitution. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. This is, in a sense, an interpretation of the Torah. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a really good way to put it. Right. So if the, if the most important thing is proper worship and the soul worship of Yahweh, what would, what would be the most grievous sin from the perspective of the DH? Um, other gods. Yeah, to worship other gods. Right, what's the nice word we get that? Idolatry. Idolatry. Yeah. Idolatry. And we can even we can broaden that out even more and say apostasy. Mm -hmm. Right, which is improper worship. Idolatry is, is worshiping other gods, apostasy is improper worship. Right? This is the greatest sin from the perspective of the Deuteronomistic historian. Okay? Is apostasy and idol worship. This is why Israel will get punished, because they have fallen into these ideas, right? They are contaminating themselves. They are no longer set apart as a people who only worship Yahweh, right? This is why when, in the Deuteronomistic <coughs> history, um, remember I told you about like, the kingdom splitting and that northern kingdom having two calves in the north and the south? This is why that's so easily condemnable, right? Because... It's not worshiping at the central place that you should be worshiping, right? Which is Jerusalem in the south, 
but it's also being cast in this light, right? Just apostasy and idolatry. Did you have? No, because I did the most. He chose maybe a lot. What do you mean? A lot of wrong doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but the wrong. What's interesting is that the wrong that we see being talked about in uh, Joshua through Kings is centered here. Whereas when you start looking at the prophets, the prophets kind of leave this idea behind, and they start talking about justice. All right, they say, you have focused on this for far too long, and you have neglected justice. Mm -hmm. Right? So we get a totally different lens. Like, you guys have heard the phrase, like, you're looking at the world through rose-colored lenses? Yeah. yeah. Right? In the sense that, like, you are looking at the world through, like, through a very particular perspective that paints everything in a happy way. Right? This isn't exactly rose colored lens, but it's a very particular perspective from which to view the world and what's going on and why things are happening. Right? Remember, we talked about um, a lot of these narratives being sense making narratives, how the authors and the people are trying to make sense of their world, trying to make sense of what's happening. Right? From the perspective of the DH, they're going to say, we are successful and we are happy in our land when we obey the Torah when we have proper worship. We fail and we're punished when we fall away from that. Right? That's how they're going to interpret why things are happening. All right? that makes sense? Good. Um, good. Um, just to kind of wrap up today, we might end a little bit short here, but we talked about the idea of deuteronomistic uh, history has been kind of a collage, right, of different ideas. And one way that that happens is in this idea that this is what Joshua did, and this is what Israel looked like. Okay, there are there are these little minority voices that kind of pop up within Joshua that says, oh, I don't know, it wasn't really all the land. <laughs> they, they weren't really utterly exterminated. Um, for example, let me see here. Um, well, first of all, the first nine chapters of Joshua, right? Chapters one through nine deal with two cities. There's just two, two cities. Those whole nine chapters are just two cities. Um, if I bring up a nice little map here, I know this is tiny, but here we have the region of Naphtali. Here we have Benjamin. And here is Judah, with the exclusion of Simeon. Those are all tribes, right? These are tribes, right? Remember what it said? We read that part where it says, um, and Joshua gave to each according to his tribal allotment. These are the tribal allotments, OK? So the tribe of Judah gets this chunk, not Simeon. Benjamin gets this. Naphtali gets this. Everything that pretty much gets narrated in Joshua centers on these three places, right? There's a lot of Israel where we don't have any stories in, in Joshua about. Mm -hmm. Joshua focuses in these three places. Um, there's also phrases such as in um, 11.19 where it says, not one city was left except Gibeon. Um, in 11.22, we've got some Anakim, which is just a group of people remaining in Gaza. Um, Rahab's family, who are Canaanites, are also allowed to remain in the land because they help some of Israel's spies, right? So we start, even within Joshua, it's not really clear that everything was taken over because there's this huge swath of land and certain cities that don't get taken over, right? And there's some people, such as the Anakites and Rahab's family, that are still left in the land. So it starts kind of chipping away at this idea of the land being totally taken over by the Israelites. And that even gets further, uh, more doubt gets cast on that when we start looking at Judges. Because the way Judges opens is with this whole list of places that the people still haven't conquered. And a lot of these are actually kind of major cities, such as Kof Kof Jerusalem. Right? That's like saying, like, oh, you know, we conquered Europe, we just haven't conquered Paris yet. And it's just like, well, have you, have you really conquered it then? <laughs> you know, if there's these, still, if these major cities are still occupied by the original people, have you really conquered this fully? 
So just to kind of get our, our brains fitting in order so that we can start thinking about how the book of Judges might shed um, some light on what this might have actually historically looked like, what kind of archaeological evidence would we look for if Joshua, Joshua's portrayal of Israel's entry into the land is true? What kind of things would we look for if we say, if, if we're trying to find evidence of a huge army coming in and taking over the land in one fell swoop? Right. Like mass, mass, mass graves. Yeah, that's the first thing I thought. Okay. Look for, yeah, mass graves because, right, everybody is utterly okay. discerned. Yeah. <laughs> right, we're going to look for, for a lot of human remains in one place. Good. What else? A lot of the treasures will be sent to Wow. Okay. For, because they've been, been put in the temple? Right. Good. What else? Good. So maybe like some extra biblical evidence, right? Other writings from maybe surrounding countries being like, oh, you Most know, state. back in right. this, yeah. at the reign of this king when Israel just came in and decimated these groups. Good. We look for that. Definitely, Jay. Was it, was it, was it, I don't know if I'm right. I'm sorry. Um, the God says that you have done. What's that? The God has spoke to Joshua and said, you have done. done. Yeah, the tough thing with that, though, is that from an archaeological perspective, you can't prove that. Okay. Right? So this, this is kind of like, it's the thing, like, because that would be a faith claim, is, okay. is saying that, like, God did that. Okay. So we're, we're trying to look at this from, a, from an archaeological and scientific perspective oh. and say, like, what kind of evidence can we look for? With Thelma, with you. If you leave one place and you move to another place, there's going to be some evidence of things that you left there. Good. Definitely. If you are a whole different culture coming into a place, there's going to be one, there's going to be a kind of unified time where we see one culture and then we see another one. Right. Right. Think about if, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the U.S. was invaded and taken over by Japan. Right. All of a sudden, like our, like the kind that we wouldn't have, you know, silverware would kind of disappear because we would, <laughs> right? I mean, like these things are like physical aspects of a culture. That are going to shift. So that would almost be like if all the illegal stuff. We would have to hide it. Yeah. Yeah, like we have to hide it in, you know. yeah, and it would eventually just go away. You know? And so that kind of idea, like if you have this group of Israelites coming in and just completely decimating the population and bringing in their own culture, we're going to start seeing evidence of that foreign culture in kind of one fell sweep. So didn't they find some of those things like that? We'll get, get to that. We'll get to that when we talk about. Judges. What about also, um, you know, and how it talks about the towns being destroyed? Mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna find remains of towns, kind of in a unified. We should see evidence of destruction within a fairly short time span, mm -hmm. right? Less than a hundred years. We should find like, okay, all of these cities kind of fell, right? Because there's this whole group of people coming in and just wiping out the whole land. Yeah. My question is. I guess maybe we'll get that in Judges too, but the DH only concerns the three tribes, like those three tribes. Where are the other tribes as histories? Well, we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we'll look at because Judges deals a lot more with the tribes. Okay. Joshua's not gonna. Joshua doesn't even really mention these tribes by names. Yeah. It's just the cities that they're dealing with exist here, because remember Joshua. This is the this is the picture Joshua took. Is all Israel. So Joshua's not going to say, hey, Judah moved in, and Benjamin moved in, and Naphtali moved in. It's going to say, all of Israel came in and defeated this city, and this city, and this city, and this city. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So my question is, instead of them, you know, just like letting buildings fall to the wayside, why, did not, why didn't the Israelites, like, live there? Why didn't they make that, you know, as they were moving through the land, why didn't they just... Settle. Yeah, certain people settled as they were moving. Instead of just like yeah. burning them up or them knocking them down. Yeah. Well, the question, the question from our perspective, looking at the book of Joshua, is why is, jo why is the book of Joshua narrated such that they don't leave the cities? And they don't leave any, Joshua, from Joshua's perspective, from, this, from the perspective of the story, they're not leaving anything because and it's unclean. Mm -hmm. Right, that's what I'm right. saying. So oh. who gets to decide what the promised land is? Who decides that? What do you mean? Like, 
That's what I'm saying. Like, they're just swooping in and tearing everybody up and everything. So it's all not plain there yet or something? Like Who's not? They're not in the promised land yet? No, they are. So they're moving into the promised land to take oh. it because they've yeah. been given to them. Yeah. Like, this is this is the apartment that God is saying, hey, these tenants that I have in here are awful. It's just, it's just a bunch of cockroaches coming here and squash them, and it's yours. Yeah. Right? Right? This, yeah. Right. Right. And that's clean it out. That's the narrative that Joshua's giving us. Any other words? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So remember, this is, this is kind of where we need to like kind of separate in our brains the difference between okay what actually happened, which we'll dig into um, on Monday, and just kind of how the text is portraying that. Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> how the text is narrated. Because the text is trying to portray meaning. The text is trying to emphasize this cleanliness and the fact that they are coming in and cleaning house in a sense, so that they can exist in Canaan without being corrupt by the ways of the Canaanite people or the possessions of the Canaanite people or the idols of the Canaanite people. It's like when they buy a building and decide to pick a parking lot and they have to take the whole thing. They're holding down. Yeah. Cool. You guys, enjoy your long weekend. I'll see you Wednesday.